everyone, I am live. Can anyone hear me? Is there anyone in the chat room? Anyone around on this fine Saturday evening? Yeah, I see some people here. Okay. All right. You guys can hear me? We all good? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for commenting on the shirt. I deliberately, um, I, I was going through some of my old clothes and I uh, found this old thing that I've had for years. God, this would have been back when Hogan came back in 2002. And I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm just going to wear this thing and look like a beach bum while I'm here. Now, if I, if I could just tan and if I would just shave my head and grow out the, the Fu Manchu mustache, I, I would really complete the picture. But uh, got the it got the pythons, though. Got the got the 24-inch pythons, you know? But uh, that's literally the only physical similarity I have in common with Hulk Hogan. Oh, I, yes, I saw that. You tweeted the, uh, the Steiner Brothers and Authors of Pain. Who would win? Um, Steiner Brothers. I, but I'm a giant Steiner's mark, so I'm biased. Hi there. Okay, we've got Dragon Rider. We've got uh, Movie Fan, Retro Kid 64. Hi, how are you guys doing tonight? Yo, dudes. Time to watch some Saturday Night's Main Event and Class of Champions. And body slam some great white sharks, brother. Okay, let's go right into it. So, um, have some uh, a couple things I want to do on tonight's stream besides just watching Clash of Champions and Saturday Night's Main Event. Um, do you want to talk about a couple movies? Um, I I've been going to the movies and saw two in particular that I kind of want to talk about. Um, the first one was Deadpool 2, which I saw last week, but I haven't really had an opportunity to talk about it here on the channel. Uh, all I'll say is, because I don't want to spoil anything, but... If you like Deadpool and you like the first movie, you're going to love this one because this movie, very, very entertaining. I loved it. I think it's, um, if I had to compare it to the first movie, it's not as good in terms of, I guess, story. But if you want the jokes, this movie delivers the jokes and the laughs and the chaos and the mayhem in spades and is amazing just for that. So. I was consistently laughing throughout the entire movie. Okay, I'm just reading some of the comments here. Yep. All right, yeah, have fun, uh, Dragon Rider. Have fun at Deadpool 2. It's a blast. I react to cartoon reboots the same way when Ric Flair went, <laughs> went to TNA. Leave the memories alone. <laughs> yep, pretty much. I'm seeing Deadpool for my birthday. That is an awesome birthday present, I must say. That, that is a very nice thing to treat yourself to. Um, but yeah, Deadpool 2 gets a huge thumbs up for me. I thought it was very good. Um, I don't want to say anything other from that because, believe it or not, there actually are things to spoil in the movie. It's not just jokes, but it's uh, very, very funny and very, very good. Uh, the other movie I saw, which I saw last night, was Solo, a Star Wars movie. Now... If you saw my review of the Han Solo trilogy, my Star Wars book review, um, I previewed the Solo movie in there and I pretty much said that uh, I felt like the movie was going to be a disaster. Um, and my expectations for it were really, really, really friggin' low. Uh, I'm happy to report it's actually not that bad. I actually kind of sort of enjoyed it. It it's not a great movie, and I wouldn't say it's required viewing for Star Wars fans or anybody. Um, it might even be the most pointless Star Wars movie ever made, because do we really need a Han Solo prequel? But uh, for what it is, it's an entertaining, fun action-adventure film. And uh, it's got, like I said, it's got its problems. Um, the actors are mostly fine. I really like Glover as Lando. I thought he was very charming in it and pulled that role off very well. Um 
unfortunately, the weas- weakest actor in the film is Han Solo himself, and I don't want to rag on him too much uh, with the detour so simple. But it's, you know, he had the toughest shoes to fill, and uh, he wasn't, you know, comparing him to Harrison Ford, he wasn't exactly like Harrison Ford, which is, that again, that's a huge, tall order. Some scenes he was really good, other scenes he didn't quite, match up real well and he felt like he was cosplaying but again that role carries the most baggage with it so i'm not surprised um what star wars video games would you like to see made into a movie or series um i guess i'll count shadows of the empire i'd like to see that i i always wanted that as like an animated film if they wanted to do like a directed video thing I'd, i'd have been fine with that Um, but yeah, uh, Solo, getting back to Solo, it was, a it was just a fun adventure film. Uh, there's a lot of really good action set pieces. One thing I will say of the new films that Disney has done, I think this one was my favorite looking one out of all of them. I really liked the look of the film. It had a very kind of grimy, dirty, uh, organic look to it. It looked really good. I was like, Ron Howard, man. And that dude deserves a medal because that movie had Razzie Award written all over it. And I think he pulled them out of a tailspin. This this is a movie that should have been a disaster. And I think Ron Howard, excuse me, I think Ron Howard uh, gave us something that was at least mildly entertaining. And, um, and again, I'm trying not to get into spoiler territory here, but uh, yeah, just I, I guess just go watch the film and decide for yourselves. But I don't, um, I, I am kind of feeling the Star Wars oversaturation. I think Disney's overdoing it. They don't need to make a movie every year. But uh, for what it was, I thought it was an enjoyable film. Uh, again, if it had never come out, we wouldn't be missing anything. But since it did come out and I saw it, I was like, okay, I mean, I wasn't miserable. I didn't hate it. And there's some really good action sequences and some fun character moments. And some of the side characters they created are fun. It's it's just a fun fun movie. That's really all it is. There's nothing more uh, substantial to it beyond that. Is, Star- is Solo the weakest during the Disney era of Star Wars? Where a lot of people say that would be The Last Jedi. And that's, for me personally, it it probably is the weakest. Well, I don't know. Force Awakens is kind of like, that's the safest friggin' movie ever made. <laughs> so I'm kind of like, I don't know. It's really weird. Um, uh, my opinions on it are a little kind of scattered, but it's. I don't think this one's going to divide people the way Last Jedi did, but I don't think it's going to excite people that much either. So it's depending on how you feel about that. Did you hear about the rumors of a Kenobi movie being made? Yeah, they did something at the end that I felt set up the Kenobi movie, but we'll, I, I don't, again, I don't want to go into spoilers, but we'll go there. Um, if you're going to do a Kenobi movie, my set, personally, take the Kenobi book, which I've already reviewed, go back and watch my video review of it, and just adapt that into a movie. That's, I mean, the job's done for you, basically. You don't really have to try that hard. I talked to someone that said Rogue One is his favorite Star Wars movie. Honestly, Rogue One is its another one of those movies that is completely pointless in the grand scheme of things, but it's very entertaining for what it is. I really like it. Um, uh, but, yeah, that's just me. I like it because it was basically just Dirty Dozen in space, which was fun for me personally. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other things to talk about in regards to this film. Oh, um, Emil Clark, uh, who you may know as uh, Daenerys Targaryen from Game of Thrones, was not bad in this. I typically don't like her as an actress. I don't like her on Game of Thrones. I did not like her in Terminator Genesis. And I just like, every time she shows up on screen for me, I just kind of get this like eh, twitching reflex. I'm like, oh God, I'm ready to be miserable. She was unintrusive in this film. And that's, that's in a weird way, that's kind of a microcosm for Solo as a whole. It's like this movie's unintrusive solidly entertaining um you're not missing anything great if you skip it but if you do go see it you won't be miserable either that that pretty much sums it up uh which actor alive or dead would you like to play uh grand admiral thrawn um in animation uh, christopher lee's voice uh just always seemed to fit perfectly for me like when i envisioned grand admiral thrawn um 
it was always with Christopher Lee's voice in mind, and that's that always made the most sense for me. Uh, he doesn't look the part like Christopher Lee. God rest his soul. He never looked the part of Thrawn. I mean, not that there are any blue skinned people running around, but he's like he like uh, just in his facial features, he didn't look like Thrawn. So if he was gonna play Thrawn, it would have had to have been in animation. But I always kind of like God. That voice would have just been perfect for Thrawn. A Terminator Genesis is one of the worst things I've ever seen. That was just an exercise in futility all the way through. Yeah, Christopher Lee's great. I love. I, I mean, I adore Christopher Lee. So I'll, I'll put that dude in anything. I would, if I were making a My Little Pony movie, I would have tried to cast Christopher Lee because it's like, fuck it, I love Christopher Lee, and he wouldn't have said no either because I've seen some of the movies he's done. He did Gremlins two, the Tim Burton Alice in Wonderland. I'm like, that dude does not know how to say no. So. I'm talking about him as if he's still alive, but God, I, God, I loved him. Loved him so much. But uh, now that I've gotten the movie reviews out of the way, I think I'm pretty much done with that. Let's go ahead and jump into Clash of Champions. Um, if you're following along on the WWE Network, uh, go down to Vault, uh, click on Clash of Champions, and we are going to go all the way to 1990, which will be... Um, we're going to be on Clash of Champions 12, Wednesday, September 5th, 1990. Did you know that Christopher Lee said him not being in the original Halloween was his biggest mistake? What role was he up for in the original Halloween? That's, I, I'm curious. Was he supposed to be Dr. Loomis? Because that actually, I can see that working. Yes, he did. Which is why, yes, Christopher Lee did have the coolest voice ever, which is why he was perfect for Saruman in Lord of the Rings. It's like, yeah, it's like Saruman's supposed to have a powerful voice. Christopher Lee's perfect for that. Dr. Loomis, yeah, I can actually see that working. Have you ever listened to Christopher Lee narrate the Dracula audiobook? I did not know that existed. Thank you for telling me. I'll be sure to download the ever-living fuck out of that. Is it as good or almost as good as Stephen Fry narrating Sherlock Holmes? Because if so, I'm down like a motherfucker because that was like the greatest joy of my life, getting to hear Stephen Fry narrate uh, Sherlock Holmes. But uh, yeah, um, good, good stuff here. So, or, I'm sorry, I'm just catching up on the comments. At first they said they wanted Peter Cushing, then it was Christopher Lee, and then they got Donald Pleasance. I mean, Donald Pleasance owns Dr. Loomis. I mean, that he was great in that role, but yeah. It's available on Spotify. I will check that out. That sounds right up my alley. Okay. So if everyone's following along, we're going to jump into Clash of Champions right now. Like I said, WWE Network, go down to Vault. Um, look for Clash of Champions. We're going to go into 1990, and it'll be Clash of Champions 12. I'll give everybody a minute to kind of catch up. Have you ever thought about reviewing the Halloween movies? Um, not really, because I don't think I could offer anything that different. One of the reasons I was excited to do the Godzilla movies, because I really feel like I offer a ton of knowledge and different perspectives of the Godzilla movies, because I've seen them so many friggin' times. But when it comes to, like, uh, Halloween, I mean, there are people way more uh, knowledgeable about horror that can tell you way more about those movies than I ever could. So, and to be perfectly honest, all I can tell you is that I love the first one. I really like the second one. I enjoy Season of the Witch for what it is, even though it's technically not a sequel. Um, and four was okay, five less so. Six was a disaster. Um, I liked H2O. I wish it had been the last one. Resurrection was a piece of shit. And then the Rob Zombie remakes I can I can do without. Uh, Halloween 1 is one of the best horror movies ever made, to be perfectly honest. It's one of my personal favorites. I watch it every Halloween. Okay. All righty. All right, I, I think I've given everybody enough time to kind of catch up to me on the network. So if you're on the WWE Network, uh, we're going to go into Clash of Champions 12. All right, Wednesday, September 5th, 1990, Clash of the Champions 12, Fall Brawl 1990, Mountain Madness, features Sting defending the World Heavyweight title against the Black Scorpion. Now, this will be the first Clash of Champions 
with Sting as the World Heavyweight Champion. And his major program is against the Black Scorpion, one of the most notoriously bad uh, gimmicks in the history of WCW. It's legendary in how bad it is. The theme music for Halloween is insane, I agree. Um, is amazing, I should say. Yeah, I, I love the theme music to Halloween. That's that's one of those movies where it's like you can't picture that movie without the, the music. It, like, if you remove the music, the movie doesn't work. At least not as well. I don't, uh, okay, I don't like um, against Mecha Godzilla, but a lot of other fans do. That's interesting. Um, I don't, I don't know what the prevailing opinion is on that one. Um, I, again, I wasn't that big a fan of it. It's one of my lesser favorite ones. It's surprising to me that a lot of fans like it, but um, I don't know. It's just, it had a lot of good ideas. It was just, uh, it feels like an incomplete movie and they don't capitalize on their good ideas and the characters are a drab. So um that that's just me apparently but uh now tokyo sos i enjoyed it's like all right it, at least we got a legitimate sequel out of this millennium series but uh anyway okay i've got the play button now if you're following on the network we're going to turn it on in five four three two one see i'm breaking the rule on wayne's world where uh you know you're not supposed to say one. Oh, whoa what happened oh i'm sorry i clicked on the wrong thing wait a minute all right, we're going to count down again. Exit out, we're going to count down again. Five, four, three, two, one. Camp WWE. I only ever watched the first episode of Camp WWE. Yep, it is clash time, indeed. Indeed. So has anybody got any fun plans for Memorial Day weekend? Besides watching me watch... 30-year-old shows. <laughs> Clash of the Champions 12. a relaxing intro it's just kind of like oh look at all these images of the wrestlers it's got this nice music it's nice uh cartoon landscape that they're showing us hello jim ross hello pelter how are we doing uh you came in just in time we just turned on the clash Mind games? Mind games? I didn't know that term, that wrestling cliche existed back then. Mountain Madness sounds like a horror movie. Might even be a horror movie for all I know. Do you think this will be the first bad clash? Well, I wasn't a huge fan of number five. Uh, I thought that one was a weak one. I also... Uh, uh, didn't like last week's too much, but yeah, this one, I think this one's going to be the starting point of like where the clash gets really, really shitty. Cause we go through a period where the clash gets super shitty, but at least I get to mark out for this. I love this song. This is such a great song. They're playing the music video too. It's great. Bad Street, Atlanta, GA. Bad Street, in the whole USA. That's so cool. Uh, 
missed last week's stream. Then I realized it was Flair JYD. Was it as bad as I remember? It was a fairly, like, flat match. It wasn't, like, the worst thing ever, but it was just this kind of, like, dull main event, and they didn't do a whole lot to make up for it. Uh, Retro Kid 64, give me some examples. Um, examples of what? Of terrible matches on the Clash. Well, uh, the Master Blasters are going to be on this episode, and there's some funny stories about how bad some of their matches were. And keep your eyes open for those Master Blasters. One of them looks quite familiar. The Confederate Boys! The Baby Faces! God, both the baby faces and the heels are wearing Confederate flags. <laughs> Confederacy forever. Did you see that awful Sami Zayn Lashley segment from Raw? I went back and watched it. Yeah, it was as bad as people said it was. It was uh, quite astonishingly bad. Who are the Master Blasters? Um, I will talk about them more when their match comes up. Okay, this was actually, uh, this was the opening match from last week's uh, Clash that we watched. Freebirds versus the Southern Boys. There is an NES game called Master Blaster, uh, or Blaster Master. There is. I've played that game. Um, I think I still have it, actually. It's a, it's a really good one. Well, I think, uh, Master Blaster, I think it was a reference to uh, Beyond Thunderdome, the Mad Max movie, where he fights uh, Blaster Master in the Thunderdome. Two men enter, one man leaves. Two men enter, one man leaves. Bullet Bob. Oh, super kick. Have you seen this week's NXT? No, I haven't. I haven't watched any wrestling this week. Um, I'm like way behind. I actually, uh, the thing I watched this week, I started catching up on uh, finally watching the third season of Twin Peaks uh, that aired last year. God damn, that is a weird friggin' show. That is such a weird show. Okay, there's a title match next week. Cool. High crossbody. The heels go down. One, two, no. Gee, who do the fans root for? Do they root for the Confederate guys or do they root for the Confederate guys? It's like they don't even have options. <laughs> they're even kind of wearing matching tights in a way. Like both teams, they're kind of like similar like color schemes at least. Oh, that looked like... Okay. Drop kick. Another drop kick. Do you think that Sami Zayn is unsavable at this point? I guess nobody's unsavable, but it's like they've devalued him to the point where I am not going to tune into Raw just to watch Sami Zayn. And that's unfortunate, but that's how it is. Did you see the first Jurassic Park in theaters? I did not, and it is one of my biggest regrets. Um, I didn't see it because my parents, or spe specifically my mom, was super strict back then about, like, oh, you can't go see 
violent movies and she was convinced that that movie was super 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 violent and i shouldn't see it and it was like one of the defining movies of my generation i'm like damn it mom damn <laughs> Get a great matches here, ladies and gentlemen, over 30 stars on this program. And we are live in Asheville, North Carolina. Pastor Champions Trial. What went wrong? Uh, NWO and WWE in 2002. I actually don't feel like I need to do that one. I thought uh, Bruce Pritchard's podcast, Something to Wrestle, uh, caught that or covered that pretty well. They're fantastic competitors and they've been champions, Jim. They know what it's all about in the ring and they really know how to deliver. What are your thoughts on Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom? Okay, when I saw the first trailer, I was like, that looks stupid. I don't want to see it. Then I saw the second trailer, and there's a goddamn mutant raptor going around stalking people in their bedrooms and stuff. I'm like, okay, this looks stupid, but fun stupid. I want to see the fun stupid. It looks schlocky as hell, and I'm like, I kind of want to see it. So if they give us some schlocky shit, I'm on board with that. How do you define wrestling legend? Um, to me, a wrestling legend is somebody that I would talk to my kids or the next generation about. It's like, you should have seen this guy. You know, that that's a legend to me. Like someone that, um, somebody that I want to transcend his time period and would want to pass down to other fans. Have you read the Jurassic Park book? Hold on. I have. I have indeed. It's a great book. I love the book. Who would you have had? Who, uh, what role would you have put Jake Roberts in uh, if you put him in a horror movie? Uh, he would have been like, uh, like in a Texas Chainsaw Massacre capacity like the patriarch of the fucked up like horror family something like that he'd been great at that did you see the promo jericho cut at best of the super juniors um where he was basically racist it was awesome um I did see the one he cut where it was like him filming himself and he was like oh look it's a turtle and he's like oh you're tranquilo I'm fucking crazy. I'm not tranquilo. I'm fucking crazy. I saw that. Is that the one you're talking about? Jake Roberts uh, sitting in a rocking chair warning pe people about the haunted house. Yeah, that would be a good role for him too. What are your thoughts on the upcoming Venom movie? I, I'll be honest. I think it looks bad. It, it looks like a, a disaster waiting to happen, but I, I mean, we'll see. I've been wrong before. It's, I don't like the trailers. The trailers look sloppy, and the acting doesn't look that great. I'm like, uh. And it's my same question I had about the she show. It's like, okay, like with the she show, it's like, how can you do a she show without doing a He-Man show first? Well, Venom, it's the same thing. How can you do a Venom movie without tying it into Spider-Man? That doesn't make any sense. First movie I saw in theaters was... Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1990. Um, I was five years old, and I was like a kid in a candy store. I was super happy. And there's the hot tag. And back body drop. Back body drop. Drop kick. Drop kick. Okay, yeah, same one. Yeah, that was an awesome promo. I loved it. Bullet Bob getting involved. Baby faces cheat. Yay. No, no. Freebird broke up the pin. Double shoulder block. Come on, ref, get control here. Get one of the Southern boys out of there. Oh, they missed with that one. Oh, 
What went wrong? Feast or fire? The concept. Uh, okay, they just did a double sunset flip pin. Referee counted them. One, two, three. Did they even pin the right? Did the legal man pin the legal man? I don't blame the I don't blame the free birds. They should be pissed. They cheated. Oh, now they're beating up Bullet Bob. Oh, DDT Bob Bullet Bob. What did you think of the Triple H HBK Hell in a Cell at Bad Blood 2004? I remember liking it. I know it went long. Um, I remember enjoying it. What's your favorite DVD cover? God, I gotta think about that. Um, I don't know. That's a that's a good question. I have to go through my DVD collection and find a find a good one. Could you do a top 10 worst commentators? Who would be your number one? Uh, my number one would probably be... Uh, probably Mike Adamley. Mike Adamley would probably be my number one worst of all time. What went wrong? RVD and TNA. A lot. The Steiners! Steiner still stumble even back then he was stumbling over his words. I love Scotty. I love him so much. He's a meathead. He's the best. Worst commentator, heel Michael Cole. Yeah. Yeah. Elvira. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. If I can count guest commentators, yeah, Elvira is pretty awful. Buddy Landell. Nature Boy Buddy Landell. Got two days. We got to have a feud with Flair, the Battle of the Nature Boys. The Burger King Ringmaster Contest? What the fuck is that? Captain Mike. He's still going with that name, huh? Captain Mike Rotunda. Okay. FT Legend, welcome to the stream. How you doing? Todd Pettengill, he was another bad one, yes. Everything he said sounded cheesy. Literally everything he said. He could never make anything sound serious. If you get one replica belt for free, what would it be? I'd have to decide. It's either the Winged Eagle belt, the Big Gold belt, or the Million Dollar Championship belt. One of those three. I would probably roll a dice or something to determine which one. Are there any matches you liked when you were younger but don't like now? Um... God, I have to think about that. I'm trying to think of like a really obvious one, but I remember really liking Ric Flair and Mr. Perfect from that early episode of Raw in 93. And then when I went back and watched it as part of my classic match reviews, I was like, wow, that didn't hold up well at all. You know, that that's one example. Wasn't Buddy Rogers also a nature boy? Yes, he was. Two, and of course we are anxiously awaiting 
something about uh, the black scorpion. Will we find the black scorpion? <laughs> <laughs> I feel, you know, whenever something shitty is going on on television, I always feel so bad for the commentators that have to sell it. It's, God, that must feel horrible to have to put over something like the gobbledygooker or Giant Gonzalez or something like that. Worst matches ever. Oh, God. Uh, if I had to do like a top 10 worst matches ever, I'd, I, I'd never be able to finish it because I, I could think of so many. You mean how every commentator has to put over the same shit happening every week? Yeah. Concrete Crypt is up there. That's a pretty bad one. Did Cena and JBL ever have a steel cage match? I remember watching it when I was small, but can't find it online. And I remember that this was the first time, distinct time I hated Cena. I think it, um, I think it was JBL anyway. I don't remember if they had a cage match or not. Um, I'm not going to say they didn't. I don't remember seeing it. I remember JBL had a cage match with uh, Chris Benoit. I remember that one. He had one with Eddie Guerrero. And he had that barbed wire cage match with Big Show. But other than that, I don't remember. This match is so exciting. It's so exciting. Rotunda and Landell, they are just lighting it up right now. And the, they are so interesting, and the fans are so into them. It's uh, this is this is a real Matt classic going on right now. What did you think of the finish in the Big Show JBL cage match where Bradshaw cried out from under the ring? I thought that was great. I loved it. That was like, because I thought Big Show won. I was like, holy shit. They get, they put the belt on Big Show. And then when I saw what had happened, I was like, holy shit. That is a great creative finish. <laughs> so this match is Bray Wyatt Sr. versus not Ric Flair, basically. Other than Concrete Crip, what are some of the worst gimmick matches? Um... Punjabi prison, I don't like. It's too messy, too many rules. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, TNA did one in 04 that nobody remembers, but it was literally, um, it was called the Luck of the Irish match, where, and this, yes, Vince Russo came up with this. You have four foot lockers in the four corners of the ring, and one of the foot lockers is full of weapons, but the wrestlers have to fight over a football that has the key to the foot lockers. And they have to fight over the football, which has the key at the end tied to it. And they have to use the key to open up the foot lockers. And the one who's able to open up the foot locker with the weapons in it gets to use the weapons. It's the most convoluted shit I've ever heard in my life. And the entire time, I'm just like, why not just shake the box to find out which one has weapons in it? Like, this, none of this makes any sense. It's ironic that Landell will test his opponent. New series, what went right? Uh, what led to a particular feud match or gimmick uh, being as good as it was? I actually... Okay, Rotunda just uh, hit a backslide for the win. Uh, that was mercifully short. I'll give it that, but not the most exciting match. Um, Chamber of Horrors was pretty bad, yeah. I pity whichever commentators had to put over that match. Oh, God. Yeah. But uh, going back to your FT Legend, your comment, um, what went right? I have an idea for a what went right video. I won't say anything because uh, it's not going to be – I'm not going to do it for a while. It's going to relate to the live streams I do for Saturday Night's Main Event and Clash of Champions, and I'll talk more about it when we get around to that time period. But – 
But uh, yeah, uh, I do have a what went right I video idea. What went wrong? DX in 2009, everything. I hate them. <laughs> Cuffed in the cage. Oh my God, I'm forget. I remember some of these terrible ideas that Russo had. Cuffed in the cage is the dumbest thing ever. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. What went right? The build to Starcade 97. Yeah. What went wrong? The main event to Starcade 97. This is the Freebirds cutting a promo in case you uh, didn't know. <laughs> they get their spiritual strength from Robert E. Lee. Knocking stuff over here. What went wrong? Ken Shamrock. What went wrong there? They just didn't push him. I mean, he could have been like a top guy, I think. He just didn't. They never got him up to that next level. Um, and I don't think it was anything he, anything wrong with him, per se. It was just kind of one of those things. How old is that shirt? I got this shirt in 2002. So, pretty old. Almost 16 years. God, they're putting the Freebirds all over this damn thing. They're in Hollywood. They're eating hot dogs. Did you know that AOP and Sanity were called out with no creative plan for them? Well, I think it shows. <laughs> I think that clearly shows. What went wrong? WrestleMania 11. How about everything? Videos made. Always felt Michael P.S. Hayes was very underrated and could have been a great mid-card singles champ. Yeah, I, I thought he was. I thought he was the most talented guy in the Freebirds, personally. Okay, now I've, if I've got this right, this match is the uh the debut of the master blasters a certain tag team of iron and steel uh tell me if one of these guys looks familiar to you who is that tall motherfucker right there some ladies might say that he's a big sexy guy you know, I hear he's a dad, and he's quite a cool dad. A big, cool dad. God damn, look at that hair. Yeah, by the way, it's Kevin Nash for anyone who's not. <laughs> yeah, it's Oz. That's who it is. It's Oz. The I believe this is the national television debut of Kevin Nash. So, a little bit of history here. Um... Jim Cornette tells a hilarious story about a match that these two had at a non-televised event where Nash's partner got completely lost out there and had no idea what he was doing and literally turned to Nash and go, what am I supposed to do? And completely went off script and was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And apparently quit wrestling immediately after that match. So the Master Blasters did not last long. 
Uh, they were green as goose shit. Okay, um, Kevin Nash's name here is Steel, and his partner is Iron. And their opponents are Tim Horner and Brad Armstrong, the Candyman, which is not a great name, but okay. Yeah, the okay. <laughs> Iron looks green as goose shit. Like. Have you ever heard that Jake Roberts was afraid of snakes? I have heard that, but... Mm. Why weren't they called the Metalheads? Uh, again, I think it was a reference to... Why did he drop to his knee on that elbow? That's Yeah, Iron does look clueless out there. Nash at least looks like... He's not rushing anything and he's not screwing up. Elbow drop. A botched headbutt. A another sloppy diving headbutt. Yeah, Iron looks completely clueless out there. And it's funny because nobody knows his real name. Nobody knows who he is. Are right, you hit that shoulder tackle okay? Has Nash torn his quad yet? No, no, he hasn't. Is Diesel the brother of George the Animal Steel? <laughs> Not to my knowledge, no. At least names today aren't as cringe as back then. It's like, ah, I don't know, like, I like the sillier comic book names. Big Power Slam by Nash. Kick out. His Neil na his real name is Bob Bra Bob Brady. Bob Brady, seriously? Is that his name? Yeah, I don't know. Like with their look here, the Master Blasters, I don't know if they're going for a look that they're like steel mill workers and they have like soot all over their bodies, or if they're literally trying to make it look like they're black. I'm not sure what they were going for here. Lars Sullivan. Yeah, I don't like... Yeah, just... Lars Sullivan, I don't like that name. It's like, just call him, like... Again, like Titan or Hercules or something like that. Oh, God. Nash's eyes on that. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I forgot about a good old Bob. I forgot about him. Is he going to do another sloppy headbutt? Oh, he did an elbow. Okay, he hit that. Leg drop. Didn't botch it. Val Venus was called El Steel in Mexico. That's a great name. The Steel. He's The Steel. All right, Brad Armstrong gets tagged in. I'm sorry, um, yeah. Yeah. Sleeper hold by Tim Horner. But Nash breaks it up. Now all four men are in. If, Bra if Brian Armstrong was the road dog, is Brad Armstrong the... Okay, double shoulder block. Two, three. Okay, Master Blasters win it. And I believe this is the last time they ever appear on television because of that story that Jim Cornette told. I would love to see footage of that match, by the way. Because that would be like the funniest botch in the history of wrestling. Makes sense because Val Venus was, <laughs> tries to steal your lady. Oh, 
Very nice. Did you mark out when you saw Macho Man and Spider-Man? I did, and I didn't know he was going to be in it. So that was a huge surprise. I did mark out for that. First and last. I don't know, Tony. I'll tell you what. This man is certainly shrouded in mystery, and there's there's definitely a lot of people out there wondering with great anticipation just what the identity of the Black Scorpion is. In addition to that, just what physical threat will the Black Scorpion pose for staying inside the ring? Okay, Jim Ross talked about the gauntlet. Now, starting right here on TV. Wow, Brian Pillman looks so nervous. He does not look comfortable cutting promos here, which is a complete 180 from where he was in 97. Objectives for someone running the gauntlet. First of all, as you can see, to win the three consecutive bouts on three consecutive days on Power Hour, WCW on Saturday night, and Sunday on the NWA main event. Oh, shit. If the man running the gauntlet succeeds, he wins $15,000. If he loses a bout, prize money is equally divided between the challenges. And Are they trying to make all three of their shows matter by explaining this running the gauntlet concept? We'll draw three names at random on the Power Hour Friday night. Those three names represent these three opponents. On the three consecutive nights. First bout will take place in the Power Hour. Second on World Championship Wrestling. Third on the main event. Flying Brian, you're the first man who's agreed to run the gauntlet. And your chance is fifteen thousand dollars starting on the blue well, team. Well, to walk through the unknown, it's uh, a situation similar to the Black Scorpion. I'm going to be taking on three unknown opponents on successive nights, and that makes preparation very, very tough. So it's like going up. I'm getting a jumping Jeff Farmer vibe from Brian Pillman here. He just looks so uncomfortable. It's going to be tough, but I can only make the one promise. I'm going to bring you everything I got. Okay, good luck to you on the 14th. He's like fiddling with his hands, like, oh, I don't really know what to do, guys. Uh, I'm nervous. He looks so uncomfortable there. Why did they air that? Jumping Jeff who? Look it up on YouTube. Jumping Jeff Farmer. Actually, let's see if I can find the link. The greatest world champion of ever. Grammar, honey. Okay, let's see if this works. Okay, I just posted a YouTube link in the chat to uh, Jumping Jeff Farmer, my favorite bad wrestling promo of all time. As a, Yeah, I'm posting Jumping Jeff Farmer while Ric Flair is talking. Woo! The Nasty Boys, Jerry Sags and Brian Knobs would have a really good tag title match at WrestleMania 7. Jeff isn't, yeah, isn't he? Jeff is intimidating. He's super intimidating. <laughs> Couldn't even say that with a straight face. Yep. <laughs> yep. I'm coming at you full force. <laughs> yeah, we've got uh, the Nasty Boys opponents are Terry Taylor, uh, who you may remember as 
one of our favorite bad gimmicks of all time, the Red Rooster, and Jackie Fulton. I expect this to be somewhat of a squash match, very much like the last match. Except the Nasty Boys are probably a little bit more polished than the Master Blasters. Did you know they supposedly want to put Lana back with Rusev and end Rusev Day and give Lana her own run again? Sure. It's like, yeah, let's take away the thing that got over. Like, that. what sense does that make? Terry Taylor is apparently a very good trainer in the WWE PC. Yeah, he's a, Terry's a great talent. He just got saddled with a terrible gimmick, and that kind of, like, polluted his whole career. Speaking of Terry, he just got the tag, swinging neckbreaker on knobs. What the heck was that promo? That was that was something special. That's what that promo was. Oh, hip tosses and arm drags. Nasty boys are getting thrown around. Maybe this won't be a squash. And actually, this is in September of 1990, so it's like they would be in the WWE like not that long after this because they were at um, – I know at least Brian Knobs was at Royal Rumble 91. So, and like I said, they were, they were in the tag title match at WrestleMania 7 and SummerSlam 91 the next year. So, yeah, here they are in WCW, and they're not going to be around for too much longer. I don't get why Vince punishes guys for getting over on their own. I don't get it either. Shows initiative. That shows grabbing the brass ring, does it not? Story goes that Terry Taylor and Seth Rollins had major heat back when Seth first got to FCW. Um, I'd never heard that. What was the heat about? Was Seth just an asshole? And Terry was like an old fart that was like giving him shit? Like, what was, what was the problem? Yeah, WWE has basically become like a perpetual money-making machine where it almost doesn't matter what they do, like, creatively. Like, they could – like, it doesn't matter. Like, it literally doesn't matter because people are still going to pour money into the company anyway. So it's like, whatever. And they had a main event where everybody walked out. Well, not everybody, but, like, a large portion of the crowd walked out. And nobody you – know, like, it didn't affect them any. Like, nobody cares. They didn't change anything. So – yeah. Okay, Nasty Boys back in control. Arm drag. Arm drag. Triple H is the reason Seth was allowed to stay. It was a, well, good call on Triple H's part. Missile dropkick. One, two. Knobs kicks out. I hate it so much when people defend the WWE's booking and... Uh, Defends WWE's booking in shows with they're making all the money. It's like, well, I mean, it's true, but that's not like a good defense. That's just like they have such brand recognition, have such a stranglehold over the art form that, like I said, it doesn't matter what they do. 
Personally, I like to watch the show that intrigues me. Call me crazy. I like to watch the show that excites me. Have you seen uh, CM Punk's uh, CM Punk reenact the Jumping Jeff Farmer promo? Yes, I have. I have heard it. It's great. Nasty boys, back in control. One, two, nope. Sunset flip. <laughs> oh, he punched the mat. Oh, now he gets him. One, two, no. Oh, the nasties go running into each other. It's like they're big and stupid. Body slam. Body slam. Drop kick. Drop kick. Oh. Referee needs to get some, uh, get a couple of guys out of there. Oh, caught him off the top and hit a power slam. Flying elbow drop by Jerry Sags. One, two, three. Jeff Farmer was like a nervous schoolboy. Yeah. Bebop and Rocksteady. You know what? If I had to choose like a wrestling equivalent to Bebop and Rocksteady, it would be the Nasty Boys. Oh, a Sid promo. This ought to be great. Fire! I hear fireworks outside for Memorial Day. Um, it's technically illegal. Uh, well, it's it's illegal on uh, in a lot of places. It's it's illegal on private property. On public property, they'll organize events to where they shoot off fireworks. At least that's what they do around my area. Do you think Jimmy Hart was a good fit to manage the Nasty Boys? Uh, he worked fine with them. He's, they're typically not the type of guy that he goes for, but he he did fine with them. Shorten to the point. That's that's a great Sid promo. And I challenge the world champion stag, Liz Blitz's rule. Let's go back to the ring. Ladies and gentlemen, in the following contest, it is set for one fall. Introducing first in the ring. Sorry, can we do that again? Oh, we're live, pal. We're live, pal. That's that's another great classic botch. Wild Bill Irwin. Versus Tommy Rich. Wait, so we got Wild Bill Irwin versus Wildfire Tommy Rich. Yeah, he was just bull whipping the ring. Shoulder tackle. Every time I see uh, Bill Irwin, I just think of uh, 
Wild Bill from G.I. Joe. Yeah! Oh! I'm, I'm the crazy cowboy helicopter pilot. G.I. Joe. The weirdest military faction in the history of American military. Woo! Doggies! I thought the wrestling equivalent to Bebop and Rocksteady were Ted DiBiase Jr. and Cody Rhodes. In terms of success, yes. In terms of like success as a team, yes. Bebop and Rocksteady was like, I think I, I coined that, didn't I? Where I called it like the Bebop and Rocksteady syndrome. It's like, look, they're just useless sidekicks that get their asses kicked all the time. They're not a threat. Bill Irwin played the goon in WWF too. Yeah. A lot of poor guys got saddled with some shitty gimmicks. Ooh, top 10 rankings. Same with J and J security. Yep, same exact thing. Same exact thing. Absolutely. Bebop, Bebop and Rocksteady were all the B teamers from WCW that. WWF hired after WCW died. Yep, pretty much. <clears throat> are these are these rankings based on locker room leadership and athletic ability? I don't know. I just love that when they debuted that SmackDown thing, I was like, wait a minute. So you're doing this ranking system, and it's not based on winning matches. What sense does that make? This is like, come on, guys. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go again. This is another kind of dull match. It's all about how you connect with the WWE universe. Yes, that's the only thing that matters. Unless you're Roman Reigns. Oh, but wait, he gets a reaction. Tommy Rich turns, flipped around, turned into a sleeper hold. Irwin pushes him into the corner. Tommy Rich with a Luthes press. One, two, three. He got it. Okay, another like mercifully short match. That wasn't very good. Here we go. Top ten rankings. Yeah, they would always rank the U.S. champ near the top, which makes sense. Top 10 tag teams. Let's go. Rotunda and Horner. Took your dog and El Gigante. That's hilarious. The Steiner brothers rank number one.
Yeah, there are people who cheer Roman, but they're always at the live events. I love how they say that. It's like, well, if you go to the live events, people cheer him like crazy. I'm like, yeah, funny that you say that when there's no footage of it. That's quite hilarious. Did he spit tobacco all over himself? Ew. That's gross. What did you think of Brian Pillman and Terry Runnels in 97? Um, bit risque. It was a bit risque. But, um, again, it was like an indicator of moving forward towards that Attitude Era. And um, I thought it played well while it lasted. Jesus Christ. Well said, Shivani. That was a great promo. I like that. Better than his performance in No Holds Barred, anyway. Women's title match. Bambi. I believe, is that Rock and Robin? I believe that's Rock and Robin. I'm just looking it up. Selena Majors. No, it's not. Okay. All right. So it's not, it's not Rockin' Robin. I thought it kind of looked like her and they said Stone Mountain, Georgia. And I'm like, huh? Susan Sexton. What is going on in Australia that they're producing? They're like a, a women's wrestling factory right now. Feels like every new women's wrestler is coming from Australia. Well, I mean, granted, this is 28 years ago, but it's just like on NXT, like all the new girls come from Australia. It's crazy. Hey, that was a great promo. Don't knock it. Shut up, Sexton. <laughs> Tony Storm. Yeah, she seemed good in the... Uh, what was it? The Mae Young Classic, I think, is where I saw her. It's like, yeah, she seemed good. I didn't get, like, enough of her to, like, get a full impression, but she seemed like she had something. Yeah, this is the first uh, women's match in Clash history, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Good line, JR. Okay. I wish New Japan would work with Stardom and have women's wrestlers on their show. The thing is, is like New Japan's roster is so like friggin' loaded at the moment that it's like, where would you put them? Like, you know, like they'd be hard to fit. It's like, and what would you drop? But they, yeah, they could do some cross promotional things and do a little bit more. Quickness. I don't think it's in and out about that. You talk about the way that uh, women's wrestling has progressed and changed. 
If you could see one in theaters, which would it be? Jurassic Park, Jaws, or Halloween 1978? Uh, Jurassic Park, because that was like the big event movie of my childhood. Uh, I wish I had seen that in theaters at the time, but, you know. Would you agree that JR wasn't as good until 1999? Uh before that, he was kind of ordinary. Um, I like Jim Ross at this point. He's not fully developed into good old JR, which, by the way, read JR's book and how he gets the moniker good old JR is the best story in the whole book. Um, Vince McMahon is a crazy bastard. That's all you need to know. But it's, uh, yeah, I like him. He's very straightforward, but he does his job, has some good lines, keeps the focus on the match and the wrestlers and the story. I, I think he does a really good job. Drop the never six-man titles. Yes, I agree. You can drop those belts totally, but there's a bunch of guys associated with those belts that I wouldn't drop. Yeah, this match isn't very good either. Just kind of, they're just kind of going around doing a bunch of moves. Did you see the Mauro Ronaldo documentary last night? No, I haven't had a chance to watch it. Roll up by Bambi. Nope. Sexton rolls her up to got her. Tell us the story. Uh, 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 what, the uh, the good old JR story? Okay, I, I'll tell it. Uh, basically, um, Vince and JR are, are driving together at night. This is right after Jim Ross was rehired by Vince in, in the mid-90s. And Vince is driving, and he's going like 90 miles an hour because he's a lunatic. And uh, he starts farting in the car, and... <laughs> Say so it's like, aren't I the best farter? That's protein, pal. Nothing but protein. And Jim Ross is like, what the fuck is going on right now? I'm fearing for my life while this madman has got his foot on the pedal and farting up a storm for no reason. Maximum overdrive. Uh, okay. I barely remember them. But anyway, um, uh, the cop eventually pulls them over. And asked to see Vince's license and registration. And Vince is like, don't you know who we are? I'm Vince McMahon with the WWF. And this is good old JR. And that's how the, that's where the name came from. We got a Steiner Brothers match. All right, maybe they can help save this show. Did you ever hear the story about Vince not knowing what a burrito is? Uh, no, I've never heard that one, but I'm not surprised. My favorite one is the mute button. He did. He he called a television repairman to come fix his TV because no sound was coming out, and the TV repairman just showed him the mute button. It's like, oh, well, the problem, sir, is that you have the mute button. Let me just turn that on for you. And Vince gave him a hundred dollar tip <laughs> for pushing the mute button. Yeah, Morrow's condition, yeah, there's some, like, dude, if you've got those issues, they can be crippling if uh, you're not treating them and not um, doing everything you can to kind of keep in front of it. We need a Vince biography. Yes, I agree. Well, anyway, to finish the uh, the driving story, uh, Vince gets the ticket, and Vince is like, but, but I'm Vince McMahon with the WWF, and this is good old JR and everything. And the officer's like, oh, I guess that makes me the big boss man. Hands him the ticket and then goes off, goes off. And then the minute the cop is gone, Vince starts speeding again. Because of course he did. God, they look like Maximum Overdrive. They look like the Acolytes, but like a blander version of the Acolytes. No, you know what? They also kind of looked like the Ascension when they were in NXT a little bit. But without like the like the paint or the tassels. 
We need a Vince autobiography. Yes. Yes. Goddamn, pal. That motherfucker Eric Bischoff gave away my results. Goddamn. Well, there is a documentary on Vince. They did the DVD uh, where Stephanie admitted that Vince wanted to do a storyline where Vince was the father of her baby, which is the most horrifying thing I've ever heard in my life. Because it's like, okay, Vince, number one, why did you pitch it? Number two, Steph, why the fuck would you admit that on camera, for God's sake? And number three, WWE production, why the fuck would you allow that to show up on the goddamn DVD? What the fuck? Damn. I mean, that's like, you know, as bad as things can get sometimes, you look at something like Katie Vick, it's like, all right, what's the shit that got rejected? And that's one of those things. It's like, oh, thank God that never happens. <laughs> thank, thank the dear Lord. <laughs> I guess that makes me the big boss man. Yeah, it's a great line. It's a great line. It's like the cop had a sense of humor. Scott Steiner. Ah, I threw you around, motherfucker. I'm Scott Steiner, bitch. Give me a fucking mic. I'm Scott Steiner. An abortion angle. Yeah. Well, they've done, I mean, they've done two miscarriage angles that I can recall. Uh, they did one with Lita and they did the one with Terry Runnels. He's fat. This fat son of a bitch. <laughs> Scott's, Scotty's just the greatest. He's just, I love him so much. He's just arm dragging motherfuckers left and right right now. Rick Steiner comes in for a double clothesline. Who, who, who? The Terry Runnels one, um, they did an angle where um, D'Lo Brown knocked her off the apron. Well, okay. Before that, Terry announced that she was pregnant, and this is while she was with Val Venus, and Val Venus was like, uh, bitch, I got a vasectomy. I'm not the father of your kid. I'm not doing this. So they did an angle where D'Lo Brown knocked her off the apron and caused her to have a miscarriage. And because he felt guilty, um, D'Lo Brown uh, like became like her manservant because he felt bad about killing her baby. That was an angle they did. I'm not kidding. And eventually they just revealed that Terry was lying. She was never pregnant. Which is like, okay, why did she say she was pregnant in the first place? I don't know. Yeah, it didn't last very long. It wasn't like, I think they knew to drop it pretty quick. Belly to back by Scott Steiner. God damn, you know what uh, Scott Steiner looks like? He looks like Kurt Angle, like in this early days of his career. Like, Scotty looked like, uh, like a Kurt Angle-like wrestler. Come on, Rick. What was worse, Katie Vick or Claire Lynch? Um, I'd say Katie Vick because it was that was more in poor taste. Like Claire Lynch was just awful. Um, Katie Vick was both awful and it was in poor taste. So. What do you think of Honor Club? I think it's a good idea for Ring of Honor to do it. I'm not currently registered to it, but 
Um, it's good for them to get in the game, I guess. Here we go. Oh, power slam! He almost dropped the poor dude on his head. Who? 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 Maximum Overdrive, wasn't that a Stephen King book? Am I misremembering that? Big clothesline, Steiner line. I keep screwing that up. Steiner line. Oh, God. Steiner Bulldog. What do they do? No. A friggin' DDT off the top. Wow. That looked insane. That's got to be the finish. One, two, three. That was one of the coolest tag team finishes I've ever seen. Okay, so Rick Steiner put him up on his shoulder, and it looked like they were going for like a, a doomsday device type move. And I'm like, oh, they're going to do the Steiner Bulldog that they've done. But it, they didn't do the Bulldog. Scott like friggin' DDT'd him off of Rick's shoulders, and it looked awesome. Damn. That was cool. All right, that was my favorite match so far, just because it was the Steiners being awesome. It's basically a squash match, and there's like, seems, seems to be the theme here. Missy Hyatt and Jim Ross every Sunday on the main event at 6.05 right here on TBS. It's the NWA main event, and we got a lot of great main event action, plus me. And we'll be back with more Clash of Champions right after this. <laughs> Mountain Madness. Yeah, we're sick. How, how deep are we into the show? Okay, that was the seventh match, and my favorite one was the Steiner Brothers squash match. Not a good sign. But now we've got Stan Hansen versus the Z Man. Scott Steiner in his prime versus Brock Lesnar. That'd be awesome. I'd like to see that, actually. Yeah, I'm sorry they did that to Ben 10, dude. I heard the, yeah. So it's not just 80s cartoons that get fucked. They do it to everything, apparently. Did you ever play the Power Rangers SNES game? Yes, I played uh, the SNES game, and I played the uh, Power Rangers the movie video game on Super Nintendo, which had very little, if anything, to do with the movie. Uh, but they were fun games. I enjoyed them. Stan Hansen's just beating the shit out of Tom Zink. Cartoon Network is running out of it. Yay. Ugh. Ugh. The title of the game, Power Rangers, the movie, the game, featuring Ivan Ooze. It's a great title. It just rolls off the tongue. What do you mean? Cartoon Network's got plenty of ideas. They've got other 80s cartoons they could, uh, you know, kidify. I can't wait for G.I. Joe Babies. That'll be great. Did you like Dexter's Lab? I did. It was a good show. I liked it. It was funny. It was smart. It was uh, enjoyable. Um, I liked it. It's very uh, creative. It was a sci-fi show, so I, you know, I gravitated to sci-fi. So it was good. Man, I miss Clone Wars. Why did that show have to die? Apparently because Disney bought Star Wars, so they just ended it. And I'm like, okay. 
He's right here. He's almost right before he's matching. You know, uh, Stan was upset that he was ranked number six, so they come right after you, Mike Luger. There's a lot of talking to out there, Stan. They're all working out the ladder. Right now, there's one thing on my mind, one thing only. Now he's going to come and come again to get him up, and that's what's going on. Stan Hansen, you know your shots, you will do it. Okay, his concentration's right with Flair right now, Tim. Thanks very much, Tony, and indeed it should be. And Stan Hansen. Being very dominant here. Perhaps the biggest understatement of the night. Dominant is his style. How did they ruin Ed, Ed, and uh, Ed, Ed, and Eddie? How did they ruin that? I'm curious because I didn't. I've never heard anything. I barely watched that show when I was younger. Did you see the Power Rangers movie in theaters? The original one from '95. Yeah, I, I saw that one in theaters. Have you seen some of the unfinished episodes of Clone Wars? I've seen like um, some clips of them and some of the ideas that they were throwing around. It's like, man, we could have had some good shit. Like Cad Bane and Boba Fett. That would have been great. I would have liked to have seen that. Big Lariat. Stan Hansen gets the win. The precursor to the clothesline from hell from Bradshaw. Okay, we've got Luger versus Flair for the U.S. title, and we've got Sting versus the Black Scorpion in the main event. Those will be our final two matches to close out Clash of the Champions 12. Okay, everybody, we are live now back in the dressing room area. Still to come, that matchup for the U.S. title, Lex Luger and the Nature Boy, Ric Flair. Certainly the matchup between Luger and Flair, one of the greatest rivalries. Yeah, I like Powerpuff Girls when I was, when it was around. I was in high school when Powerpuff Girls was around, and I liked it. I was like, dude, the show's funny. He is a champion. Let's take you back to Russell Ward this year from Greensboro. Lex Luger, Ric Flair going toe-to-toe. Okay, we're going to watch some highlights of Lex Luger and Ric Flair. Oh, man. Yeah, Flair and Luger, they had some really good matches together. Sorry, I gotta send a quick text real quick. Okay, Lex Luger, I'm sure seeing those chops bring back some memories. Okay, so they just showed clips of the match. They didn't actually show the finish. You think they would actually show the finish of the match to show like what their history is, but whatever. Have you watched the uh have you watched the 90s Marvel animated series like Spider-Man and X-Men? Loved X-Men when I was a kid. Loved that show. It was great. Um, I remember Iron Man and Fantastic Four were on at like 6 in the morning. Like they were the first ones that were on and were on super, super early on Saturdays. So I barely watched those, but I caught them whenever I could. Um, and I watched Spider-Man as well, which... I liked it as a kid. It didn't hold up well when I went back and tried to revisit it as an adult because Spider-Man never shuts the fuck up. Uh, like, if he's not talking, we're getting an interior monologue. It's like there's just always dialogue. And it's like, guys, guys, quiet, quiet. You know, you can, you don't have to have this much dialogue. But the X-Men show I think is great. I, I love the X-Men show. 
They wanted you to see the match in full on WC on the WCW Network. Oh wait, never mind. <laughs> Do you remember Dragon Ball being on super early in the morning? No, I don't. I didn't watch Dragon Ball until it came to Cartoon Network. Dun, dun. The Nature Boy. Oh, that's the robe he wore. He wore that robe a lot in WWF. The black one. Ocean dub or Funimation dub for Dragon Ball? Um, Whichever one was on Cartoon Network, because that's the one I watched. I, I, so I'm assuming it was the Funimation dub. Woo! All right, Lex Luger and Ric Flair for the U.S. title. This is, I'm assuming this is going to be the best match on the show by default. He's a baby face again. Wait until he turns heel on Sting later in 91. How is the main roster going to ruin Ricochet, EC3, Adam Cole, and Cien Almas because they always find a way? Well, how is Cien Almas doing on SmackDown? Because I, I literally haven't watched any of it. How's he doing? How many times did Ric Flair turn on Sting? Honestly, like at least, I'm trying to remember, at least three. Three or four. All right, nice shoulder tackle by Luger. Do you always get woos when you attend WWE shows? <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you always get woos when you attend WWE shows from every which way of the arena? Nowadays, yeah, pretty much. I mean, you lock on a figure four, you do a chop, you're getting woos. Sanity hasn't even shown up yet. Cien Almas has only had two squash matches. Okay. Have they aired vignettes for Sanity or anything like that? They'll probably tell Adam Cole Baby not to do the Adam Cole Baby. Yeah, why do the thing that he's known for? That's crazy. Luger with a gorilla press slam. Boom. Luger goes, or uh, Flair goes down. Surprises for the other. Then those three 
Sting has trust trust issues, but it's like the opposite where he trusts people too much. Yeah. Alistair Black versus Kota Ibushi. Um, yeah, it depends on where the match is held. If it's held in Japan, probably Ibushi. If it's held in WWE, it would be Black. If it's held in like an independent somewhere in America, they might go for Ibushi. So. They'll probably make Adam Cole, Michael Cole's illegitimate son. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. I could see them doing that. I could totally see them doing something like that. Not necessarily a legitimate son, but that make them related. Like, hey, we're cousins. Luger don't feel shit. Your chops mean nothing to my super pecs. Another gorilla press and down Flair goes. <coughs> Close line by Luger. Up and over, Flair goes. And they'll probably put Ricochet on 205 Live and then you'll never see him again. Probably. Big clothesline outside the ring. Luger's dominating. Yeah, be careful, man. You never know who's listening to this. Don't be throwing ideas like that. Another gorilla press. Jesus Christ. Make it a drinking game. Goes for the elbow and misses. No water in the pool. Ric Flair back in control of this contest. What do you think of PWG? I've only watched it a couple of times. I don't watch it regularly or anything like that. It's a good um, it's a good place for guys to work and, you know, get some experience, you know, work in front of a crowd. Yeah, it's just I, to me it was a fairly standard indie. I didn't really think anything of it uh, the couple of times I saw it. Chikara, um, I like Chikara for how goofy it is, like having all these goofy, like cartoony characters running around. But it's not like something I can watch all the time. But it's it's it was fun the couple of times I watched it. They'll probably call Velveteen Dream just Velveteen. Yep, I could see them doing that. I could see them doing that. Flair is just. Throwing Luger all over the security railings. Oh, God. Yeah, Flair is like held 10 titles and that was like an unattainable thing back then. It's like, dude, that's like, there's so many guys today that have like 45 championships. It's ridiculous. Did you know ROH will be in Baltimore soon? I had heard that. I don't know the exact dates. Square circle. Right now, is 
sent a little homework. You know, he's smelling it right now. He's smelling that power. He knows it's a little bit of trouble. You better believe he's going to be the right one. He's going to stay right on with you. Liver is third ring. Liver is third ring. <laughs> Blair just like right before he chopped Luger, he was like, Turner, uh, Turner, heard this is for you. Chop. Yeah, this is probably when Flair was having heat with uh, the the upper management of TBS and um, WCW. Oh, God. All over the security railing. The referee is like, he keeps getting in the referee's face. He's like, dude, stop it. Flair, you're a dick. Now he's attacking Luger's legs. You know what that means, guys. You should walk around your house with Real American and Voodoo Child playing in the background when you wear that shirt. Don't tempt me. I might. What did you think of Mr. America? I hated it. It was dumb. It was like, okay, so we're going to put Hulk Hogan in a mask and everyone's going to act like they don't know that's Hulk Hogan in the mask. Okay. Uh, you bought a Chikara DVD. Which one did you buy? Luger's coming back. Boom. Boom. Oh, Flair with a thumb to the eyes. Right as he was going down, he, he caught Luger in the eyes before he went down. Lex Luger with a backslide. He's got it. One, two, no. The newest one. Okay. Yeah, what are, what's, I haven't watched Chikara in a long time. What are they doing right now? Were the chants during Goldberg's entrance anywhere near as in sync in WCW compared to when he recently returned in 2006? Um, I think, well, the fans started the Goldberg chants during the theme music. So, uh, yeah, they, they seemed to work really well back then. Do you think they should have done uh, Hogan Austin at 19? And then Hogan Vince at 20. Well, um, I mean, if they were going to do Hogan Austin, the time to do it would have been at 19 because it was Austin's last show. Uh, that would have been the time to do it. H Hogan was back in the red and the yellow. It kind of like that would probably would have been the one to do. Um, I don't know if Hogan would have been available for 20 because uh, he left WWF and wasn't at 20. So who knows? Uh, but is the Vince Hogan match, even though I really enjoy it, is that one that's as important as Hogan Austin? Probably not. Just just a guess. Luger! 
Has Flair. Throws him off the top rope. Uh, Flair flips up over the turnbuckle. Clothesline. He's down. Time for the torture rack. Another gorilla press. Jesus Christ. I could turn this into a drinking game. Rumor has it that Mr. America is teaming with El Generico these days. That's a great international team. I think that, you know, USA and America, I think they'd me mesh well together. Oleg the Usurper. God, that's a great name. Would you like to see a Kevin Owens versus CM Punk feud? I would have liked to have seen it a few years ago. Uh, now it's like I don't know what kind of punk we'd be getting, but, you know. The lie detector segment. Yeah, that was fine. for what It was kind of derivative of what The Simpsons did with Mo during the Who Shot Mr. Burns thing, but it was fine. Rumor has it that El Generico trained Sami Zayn. Superplex by Luger. Pinfall. One, two. Ah, Flair put his foot on the rope. Jim Rock, God damn it. I hate that shit. It's like, oh, he took the easy way out. I'm like, no, he took the legal way out. There's nothing illegitimate about what Flair did by putting his foot on the rope. It's like he broke the pin. Come on, Jim. They called me. They called me Kid Gorgeous, and then Kid Presentable, and then what was it? It was like they first they called me Kid Gorgeous, then Kid Presentable, then Kid Gruesome, and then just Kid Mo. <laughs> just Flair jumps at Luger, and they both fall outside the ring. Into the security railing. Yeah, Flair's go-to move in this one is rip it, uh, throwing him into the security railing. Oh! Stan Hansen just attacked Lex Luger. Well, Luger wins by DQ. What the hell was that? Stan Hansen just spit tobacco on Luger. That's that is so gross. That is such a gross thing to do. Oh man. So that match, Flair Luger, uh, good match. Nowhere near as good as some of their other ones. Uh, they've had much better ones, but this one was it was a good match and easily the best thing on this show so far. And now it will maybe Sting versus the Black Scorpion can top it. We'll see. So Tony Schiavone, this is probably around the time he returned to WCW because he was still with uh, WWE. Oh my God. Oh my God. If you can beat me, I'll tell you in all the world who I am. Ole Anderson doing a gravelly voice. And Sting in Bret Hart colors. Well, hopefully I'm going to do that. It's make it or break it time for me. Taking this really serious. There's no goofing off now. I want to know who this guy is. So I'm glittering right now. Okay, Jim Bob, he is concerned. The moment is now. Yes, yeah, Sting and Black Scorpions main event could be the match of the night. Oh my God, what is he wearing? 
Sharpshooter or Scorpion Deathlock? Uh, both are cool names. I think Brett locked on the hold better, so I lean more towards calling it the, the Sharpshooter. Good. That is a very bland robe. He's trying, I guess he's trying to be like the Emperor. Looks like a druid. Is this the match where he unmasks? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. No. Because they kept this going for a little while longer. The Stinger! Did you know before he was hired by WWE, Dean Ambrose played one of the Druids? Um, that doesn't surprise me. I know they get a lot of like indie guys to step in and play those kind of side roles. The Stinger! And it was Ric Flair. Yep. Spoiler alert, dude. Spoilers. I don't care. Nobody cares. Hear those words again, mind games. All right, there's the bell. Yeah, does that look like Ric Flair to you? Sting's fighting back. Yeah, that's that's Ric Flair. That's totally Ric Flair under the mask. <laughs> Completely. Honestly, he looks like uh, one of the Master Blaster guys. He's got soot all over him. In an alternate universe, alternate dimension, Shockmaster didn't trip and became a multiple-time world champion. <laughs> oh, if only. If only. What did you think of Mae Young giving birth to a hand when it first happened? I was completely confused. When it happened, I was like, wait, how does that happen? Wait, what? How do you give birth to a hand? That doesn't make any sense. None of this makes any sense. And Vince Russo, by the way, was gone by this point. So he gets no blame for that. It's, uh, I, I still don't get it. Like, I was just utterly confused. Like, what on God's earth? No, nobody nicks that. Nobody thought this, like, hey, guys, this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. 
The hand was all grown up. Yep, they did that bit. I remember that. Oh, Sting just draped him on the security wall. Yeah, that's also true. She was too old to give birth at that point anyway. So it's like, what what the hell were you thinking? You got to know. You have to. Do you have to know? Seriously? <laughs> yeah, and it's amazing. He doesn't sound like Ole Anderson either. Body slammed by Sting. Oh, he's going for the mask. Yeah, that doesn't sound like Rick either. Did you hear that Vince Russo wanted to be in All In and Cody told him stay away from our events? Jesus. Yeah, I did hear that. Is that Jack Victory under the mask? I don't know who's under the mask for this one. Uh, let me look it up. Okay, he debuted. Um, he was played by Al Perez at this event. He's still going for the mask. But yeah, apparently it's Al Perez who's under the mask at this show, and it was supposed to be him that would be unmasked, which I'm like, okay, like Al Perez, is that really like a good answer to the question who is the Black Scorpion? But then he quit, and it was like, well, shit, we're stuck. And then in the whole shit show, like Ric Flair just got unmasked as the Black Scorpion. Is The Undertaker actually supposed to be dead as part of the gimmick? They implied it uh, in the earlier years. Like, he's actually like a dead guy that rose from the grave. Do you like Aerosmith? I do. Pre-St. Anger. St. Anger was kind of like where everything started to go downhill, but I like the earlier stuff. They originally created the angle to keep Rick out of the main event, but they didn't have anybody to do it, so Rick did it. <laughs> yeah, Rick did it if he got another world title out of it. Yep. That them's the politics of wrestling at work, ladies and gentlemen. Gorilla Press. Does Sting have him up? Yep. Slams the scorpion down. Sting goes up top. Flying crossbody. One, two, no. Son of a gun. Oh, yeah. 
Okay, I am really done with this match at this point. Can we just wrap this up? Oh, big clothesline. Stinger splash. Boom. One, two, three. Sting wins. So the Black Scorpion, your big new villain, loses his debut. He had another mask underneath. Have you been to any concerts for bands that you like? A couple I typically don't like. Oh, there's another Black Scorpion. That must be Flair. Uh, yeah, I've been to con a couple concerts. I typically don't like them because everybody acts like a drunken asshole, and I'm just kind of like, eh, eh, I'm good. How would you book a Sting versus Shockmaster feud? I would have Shockmaster trip up the aisleway and break through the ramp. <laughs> and then Sting wins my forfeit. That's my feud. <laughs> Are you watching the Chris Benoit movie? I'm sure I'll watch it when it comes out. Who should play Chris Benoit? I don't know who would want to play that role. Uh, hopefully a very talented actor. Sting's going to go after the, the other Black Scorpion. The real one, I guess. And we're back here live, ladies and gentlemen, from Asheville. We can all say congratulations to the Stinger. For the World's Heavyweight Championship. Yay! There was much rejoicing. I said, feel about the same way I did just going into this match. I came here to accomplish something. I did not accomplish it. I still don't know who he is. I don't know why he wants me. I don't know why he can't just fight me man to man, take his mask off or whatever it is. Just get down and dirty in the middle of the ring. I don't know what he's doing. I know that you have looked at the videotape of his interviews time and time again. How would you book Surfer Sting versus late 90s HBK? Um... HBK acts like a total dickhead, runs away, and Sting uh, can't get his hands on him. And then eventually you get into that. You get to you put him in a match where Sean can't get away. Oh, there's Sid! mind as it is just trying to figure out who the black scorpion is okay if you want a championship match against me talk to the championship committee i got nothing against it but right now i'm thinking nothing but black scorpion until i find out who he is how would you book crow sting versus broken matt hardy um promos production promos production it's all about like the segments and all that stuff like and they it would be the weirdest shit ever it'd be great that'd be great And Sid just beats down Sting. <laughs> Jim Ross, have you lost your mind? Jesus Christ. Vince wanted to make him the next Hulk Hogan. I'm just saying. He wanted Sid to be the next, like, super over mega baby face. 
Everyone heard the last, obviously, of the Black Scorpion. What do you think of multiple time world champion Sid Vicious? Um, great look, intimidating presence, got over. Um, he was the first big guy I remember watching that would do things like choke slams and power bombs, and uh, wasn't a big fat guy. So I kind of like, yeah, like I said, great look, great presence. Not the greatest worker in the world, but you can make up for it. And, you know, you put him in the ring with the right guy, it would turn out okay. Okay, so that concludes Clash of the Champions 12. Not a good show. Not a good show. The main angle with the Black Scorpion was kind of lame. Most of the matches were lame. Uh, the only matches that left any kind of a positive impression on me were... Uh, the Steiner brothers, just for being the Steiner brothers, uh, taking on Maximum Overdrive, and the Luger Flair U.S. title match, which wasn't even anywhere near their best match. So it was just kind of a kind of a lackluster show. I, I guess Dick Slater had a couple of good moments, but for the most part, um, this was a fairly forgettable event. And then the Black Scorpion stuff is just laughably terrible. So uh, not not a shining example of the best of the Clash of Champions. But uh, yeah, that concludes that. Uh, how's everybody still doing? We all ready for Saturday night's main event? Okay. All right, let me just send out this quick notification. Okay. All right, I'll be back in just a minute. I want to get some water before we start. Keep talking amongst yourselves. Have fun. Be merry. I've returned. Okay. All right, we're here for Saturday night's main event. All right, if you're following along on the network, you're going to go to Vault. Then you're going to go to Saturday night's main event, and we are going to go to 1987, which is the final episode of 1987, so another year bites the dust uh, for Saturday night's main event. Okay. Give everybody following along on the network a minute to catch up to me. And uh, yeah, Saturday night's main event 13. Now this one I expect to be a really good one. Um, I've seen most of this show already because uh, I've seen the Hogan-Bundy title match. Uh, and I've also seen the Randy Savage-Bret Hart match, which to be perfectly honest, might be my favorite match in Saturday night's main event history. Um Best one I've seen. Granted, I haven't seen every single match in Saturday Night's Main Event history, so we'll see if that stands. But uh, from all the ones I have seen, that is my favorite match, and I can't wait to watch it again. I think it's going to be a great one. Especially since it's this fascinating little thing where you get a young Bret Hart that's trying to find himself up against a Randy Savage that's just on the cusp of becoming one of the biggest stars in wrestling. And uh, so it's kind of like two guys that kind of need – Bret needs a little bit more experience to – help develop and find himself. Savage needs that extra oomph to get up to that upper tier world title level. So it's both guys kind of raising each other up and having this amazing match together. Um, what would you change if you did a redux of your top 10 worst pay-per-views? Well, I'll tell you what, Battleground from 2017 might be up there. The show that broke me. Backlash might be up there. Uh, this year's Backlash. Sorry if this makes you feel old, but did you know you're only one year older than Charlotte? Uh, I did not. I actually thought she was younger than that. Uh, but yeah, okay, here we are. 1987, Saturday night's main event. Uh, Saturday, November 28th, 1987. Hulk Hogan defends the WWE title against King Kong Bundy. Macho Man Randy Savage faces Bret the Hitman Hart. Bam Bam Bigelow and more. 
All right. Ow. No, don't. Go back. Why did why did it exit out? Okay. All right, we're going to turn it on in five, four, three, two, one. How are you watching that? Is it an Apple TV? No, I have a Roku. I, I have a Roku. I don't have an Apple TV or, or like an Amazon TV or anything like that. Oh, my God. The Twilight Zone music with Randy Savage is a perfect marriage. I love it. Love it so much. I'm in the danger zone. <laughs> Look at, oh my god, what is Hogan wearing? What is that on his head? It's like a bandana, but he like cut it up to have like te like frills on it. It's the weirdest looking thing. I've never seen any human being wear a bandana like that. Wow. So two big matches this week. I expect this to be a really good show as a result. Oh my god. The pre the pre-show promos of these are just so great. So great. How are you going to complain about 3-hour rolls when you watch back-to-back -back wrestling shows? Um well, it's two shows and raw it's uh, there's so much um repeating and replays and the same segments over and over again and the same tropes over and over again that is just monotonous and it's just extending it to three hours just extends the monotony and here it's like i'm watching a two-hour show that offers something different and then i'm watching like a show that's on tv was an hour and a half but here it's like barely over an hour when you when you cut commercials out and it's like quick fast paced gets to the point gives you some big matches and that's it so it's just pacing's a big part of it welcome back jesse he wasn't on last week's show Bye bye, Bam Bam. Clever line, Jesse. <laughs> I mean, he is a biased announcer. Jesse's not wrong. There he, oh, Danny Davis hitting uh, George Steele with the ring bell. Have you heard that Bobby Heenan and Tony Schiavone didn't get along? I've heard that, yes. I've heard Schiavone talk about it. Is he still playing with the Elizabeth toy? Is George is still in love with Elizabeth? <laughs> Elizabeth. Yes, Elizabeth was hurt, but she's fine now, George. You've got a match to win tonight against dangerous Danny Davis. Danny! Now, Vince 
I don't know if he understands what's happening. Right it sounds now. like Jesse's going to blow a blood vessel when he gets angry. It's like, yeah, it sounded great, though. They should do uh, pre-show promos. Uh, I guess they, you know, I guess they kind of do that on the, the pre-shows. But anyway, we've got George the Animal Steel versus Dangerous Danny Davis, a feud that was listed as the worst feud of the year by the Wrestling Observer in 87, I believe. I believe it was the Wrestling Observer that said that. God, what a dickhead. There he is. There's George. God, you know, you don't realize it until you watch all the episodes, but it's like, God, George, George the Animal Steel, he was on a lot of these Saturday Night's main events. Like, more than Andre. Chewbacca in human form. Steel is biting da Danny Davis. Oh. Danny, get the hell out of there. Good move. Good move. George Steele chases the referee out of there. Yeah, that's not working. Yeah, yeah, no selling. Yeah, I don't think Danny Davis can hurt the animal. Boom. Yep, yep. And out he goes. No Randy Savage versus George Steele for the 12th time. No, no, they finally, we've moved past that, finally. Randy Savage versus Bonesaw McGraw. Well, Randy Savage, obviously. Randy Savage couldn't even beat a teenager in three minutes. Why is it D'Lo's theme that I listen to to make me feel like a kid again? Hey, we all have our weird ones. I was a big D'Lo mark back in the day, actually. Why does it always throw me off when nobody, when uh, someone comes out to no music? Because it's, I mean, nowadays everybody has a theme music. It's just how it is. Uh, except for, oh, George the Animal Steel with a trip up. <laughs> Do you think George the Animal Steel and Broken Matt Hardy would get along? Probably. Uh, George is chasing him. Now he grabs a chair. What did Davis just, Davis just hit him with something? <laughs> Jesse. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> What's he jamming in there? Is that the gimmick? Does he have the gimmick? What do you think of IWA Mid South? Uh, again, I've watched a couple shows. It's um, it's fairly standard indie. It's fun for what it is. How has the referee not noticed that he's like sticking animal steel with something? Danny Davis continues to attack George Steele and get away with 
getting away with it. He was just shielding the referee with his body, and that's how he was able to do it. William. Oh, George got it. Hammerlock! Look at that! Danny Davis just kicked the referee. Is he going to eat the turnbuckle pad? Come on, George. You know you want it. You know you want it. Well, he should have been disqualified when he kept hitting him with that thing. And there you go. Yep, there's the stuffing. Which looks like popcorn. It kind of weirdly looks like popcorn. Danny Davis, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he gets stuffing in the face. Yep. <laughs> what do you think of Vince on commentary? I like Vince on commentary. He's biased as hell towards the baby faces, but I, I think he's fun. I like him. What a maneuver! Okay, that was a good yuck yuck match. That was not. I mean, that's not going to get high star ratings from the Meltzers of the world, but it was it was a fun like yucky yucky, jokey jokey match. And we're getting a replay of the last Saturday night's main event, where Savage almost defeated Honky Tonk, but Bret Hart broke up the pin and caused the DQ. Hence the match we're having now. The Hart Foundation beat him up afterwards, and Honky Tonk. Hit him with the guitar. Elizabeth got shoved down. And, uh, you know, uh, the Mega Powers form. What went wrong? Jenna versus Charmel, Victory Road 2009. Uh, core concept? <laughs> I mean, just core concept. That's what went wrong. God, I tell you what, Bret Hart's a convincing dickhead there in that promo. Let Jimmy and uh, Jim Neidhart do all the talking, and then Bret just stands up there looking like a cocky prick. It's like, yeah. How many stars do you think Okada versus Omega will have? 93. First ever. Dave Meltzer, 93 star match. Yep, there's the shove down. Poor Elizabeth went down. This is horrible, Jesse. Now watch it again and again and again. It's horrible. Look how horrible it is. I want to watch it over and over. God damn, why doesn't YouTube exist yet? Oh, God, Elizabeth looking just fine. Looking fine. You are fine. You are, you are very fine, young lady. I hope Cody wins the NWA Heavyweight Championship. I do too. I'd be cool with that. I'd be that, that might be a nice way to get the uh, the NWA title back into some level of prominence that it hasn't been in a while. Is Miss Elizabeth the reason you like dark-haired women? She's one of them. She's one of them. Without a doubt. Oh, God, that dress. That pink dress. It's just... Just, mm, just, just great. It's just great. It's just great. 
Look, I sees what I like, and I like I likes what I sees. What do you think of the movie Kangaroo Jack? I tried to watch that, and it's one of the dumbest fucking movies I've ever watched in my life. I couldn't finish it. It was like, no, this is too dumb even for me. And I watched the Gamera movies, and that movie was too dumb for me. What does that say? Okay. Bret Hart versus Randy Savage, my favorite match in Saturday Night's Main Event history. At least until I've watched all of Saturday Night's Main Event. We'll see if that still holds up, but... Oh, nice logo for the Hitman. I like it. They gave the Hitman a nice logo. I like it. And Hogan. What'd they do to Hogan's? They... Brian Bosworth, the Boz. That's a nice guest appearance. For you youngins, uh, Bosworth is somebody that was like a huge draft pick back in the day and like basically made himself a wrestling character to sell himself. He got drafted by Seattle and ultimately had a very, like, uneventful career. So it was, like, all this hype for nothing. But uh, Bosworth, yeah, he was he was a great character. I think professional wrestling was probably his true calling, but he went into football instead. 2000 Steph blows Elizabeth out of the water. The weird thing about Steph is that she has periods where she's super hot and then she has other periods where she looks like she got beat upside the head with the ugly stick. And it's not like, oh, she got older or, oh, you know, she got the breast implants and she instantly looked better. No, it's like week to week. Like there will be times where it's like she looks great some weeks and then she'll just the next week just look like dog shit. Like it's the weirdest thing. I'm a Saints fan, Patrick. Well, you know, you're – uh. One of your quarterbacks is the father of my quarterback, so there's a there's a connection there. Savage beating down Brett in the corner. All right, Irish whip. Uh, oh, reversal, reversal. Brett back in the corner, but he misses. Savage missed. Very quick there, very quick. You an NBA fan? Uh, not really. Uh, I watch it when I can, but I'm, I don't follow it that closely. I actually, when it comes to basketball, I actually prefer college ball. Like March Madness, I get into every year. What a maneuver. Elbow to the throat of Randy Savage. Yeah, going back to that Bret Hart logo, it wasn't the uh, the traditional Hitman Bret Hart logo that we knew from, like, the early 90s, but it had, like, this cool, like, look like a, a, like a, a target, almost, like Hitman, and it, it looked pretty cool. I was like, damn. Macho Man's got him draped over the top rope. He's the ah, referee getting in between them. Oh, knocks him off the apron into the security guardrail. Short ride, bad landing for Brett. Where did the Hitman nickname for Bret Hart come from? I have no idea. I have no idea where that came from. Uh, Brett, I think he talked about it in his book, but I haven't read his book in years, so I've forgotten. Savage is going to do some jumping here. Nope. Did you see the picture Natalia posted a few days ago about Owen Hart? I didn't. Uh, I haven't seen it. Our good seasons are once in a blue moon. Oh, nice. Meeting of the minds for Jim Neidhart and Jimmy Hart. Savage climbs up top, jumps onto Brett. Oh! 
on the way down, Brett hit him with the megaphone and caught Savage right in the gut. Very smart move by Bret Hart. Neidhart gets a cheap shot in on Macho. So much casual sexism here. He's just so open about it. Oh, shot to the gut. Bret Hart in firm control. Again, it's just so fascinating to see this. Oh, Brett trash talking Elizabeth now. Damn. He's like a good dickhead. I like it. He's not like Shawn Michaels good at being a dickhead, but he's like, it's pretty good. All right, you just sent me the tweet. Let's look at it. Tree of Woe. Savage hanging upside down. Long live Owen Hart. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. Savage gets loose. Pile driver. Pile driver. Damn. Back in the 80s when everybody did them. Savage kicks out. Come on, Randy. Yeah, it actually, the funny thing is, it actually makes sense for this match to happen because of what happened on the last episode of Saturday Night's Main Event. So there's like a storyline reason for this match to be taking place too. Oh! A lot of quick reversals here. Oh, shoulder first into the ring post. Ouchtown population, you bro. Who are your top five hottest females in WWE right now? Right now, uh, Mickey James. She'll always be my boo. <laughs> Double axe handle by Randy. Um, I would throw Sarah Logan up there because I love dark-haired women. Uh, Zelina Vega, quite quite the looker. Um, uh, Becky Lynch, uh, something about the steampunk look that really does something for me. And uh, I guess Alexa Bliss. I know she's the one that everybody says, but she's cute. Alexa's pretty cute for a blonde. <laughs> oh, goes for the elbow drop but misses. Savage back in it. Liv Morgan. Liv Morgan's pretty hot. I agree with that. Why are there less entertaining skits during feuds? Um, because they they have to produce so much content that I think they just throw shit out there. And a lot of it looks the same. A lot of it comes out dumb. A lot of it's not well thought out. And it's just they're in this mad rush to produce all this content. They're not thinking about the subtle nuances of telling the story and um, letting the stories breathe. Back body drop. Savage goes soaring out of the ring. And he hurt his leg. He hurt his ankle on the way down. Bret Hart has his opportunity to take take over and win this match. Vultures! They're vultures! Austin, Triple H, and Taker had the best skits. Taker, Taker's always had some really great stuff. He's had some bad ones, too, but like, I think back even to like early on in his career, like beating up Hogan on the funeral parlor and locking Warrior in the casket. I mean, stuff like that was great. Uh, 
when he turned face and Jake went after him and Jake slammed his hand on the casket um, and DDT Paul Bearer, all of that was great. Okay, Savage took his boot off and he's going to limp back into the ring. Oh, you know what they say about one-legged men. They don't win butt-kicking contests. They don't. Candice LaRue is pretty hot. Sasha, I don't know, the Muppet hair puts me off. Like, the, like <laughs> something about like that purple hair. It's like, you look like a Muppet to me, but I don't know. That's weird. Now, the obvious response to that statement is that, yeah, but Miss Piggy, wouldn't you fuck Miss Piggy? Otto and George actually had a whole bit about that. I did an all-puppet version of Caligula where I fucked Miss Piggy. I porked that bitch. She sucked my cock. <laughs> if you've never seen Otto and George before, YouTube it and then thank yourself. Oh, leg first into the ring post. That sounded bad. It looked bad. Savage is selling it like it was bad. It's all bad stuff here. Why would taking the boot off help you, help you in this case? Um, I think it's like a natural instinct when you hurt yourself. Because uh, I've done it too, where it's like, uh, you hurt yourself, you just want to get whatever's obstructing it off so you can immediately like let it breathe and get ice on or do something to help it. But um, yeah, there's no, there's no time to ice it, buddy. Oh, he pushes Bret Hart's shoulder first through the ring post again. Savage is limping. He's back up on one leg. He's got his chance to get back into it. Snaps him off the top rope. One, two, no. Tony Storm, yeah, she's pretty hot. Like, yeah. Oh, he's working over the ankle. But Savage is in the ropes. Got to break it. Got to break it. Break it. Break it. I said break the hold, not the leg. What's wrong with you, Brett? Half crab. Come on, Randy. He gets to the rope. He got. He, nah, he's almost there. He's out. He's there. He's there. He's under the ring. He's under the rope. Yeah. I hate how WWE thinks more finishers means a great match. A lot of guys think that, and it's it's so wrong. It's Because when you see stuff like this, it's like, all right, you're not seeing Savage and Brett do their trademark stuff to each other. You're watching the babyface get his leg broken and the heel dominating him. It's like, oh, my God, how's he going to come back and win it? That's the drama. That's the, that's the intrigue. That's the excitement. It's the little things. It's not like the big moves. What went wrong? Undertaker's 2009 world title win. Core concept. Done. <laughs> Body slam roll up. One, two, three. Savage won it. <laughs> Terrific match. Uh, again, probably my favorite match in Saturday Night's Main Event history. The only other one I would put up there with it, there's one that happens in 1990 that is very good, but we'll get there when we get there. Savage ducks. Jimmy hits Brett with the megaphone. Savage on one leg and he's swinging a megaphone around. Oh, he, he caught Jimmy there on the top of the head. That looked bad. Hope Jimmy's okay. How did Savage overcome them odds? Did you see Ziggler win on Raw with a super kick? No, I didn't watch Raw this week, but he's won with the super kick a couple of times. It's like, good. Make the move mean something. I like cradle pins when it's done like this. I do too. Yeah. Uh, cradle pins should be used. Because otherwise, you know, why do them? Like, if they never end a match, there's no reason to do them. So I, I like doing it once in a while.
Savage wins a terrific match. Oh, he fell down again. Jimmy Hart doesn't age. Yeah, he looks pretty much the same now as he did back then. He looks a little older now, but he doesn't look like decrepit. God, Savage still selling. He's still selling. Good stuff. Do your brain. All right, WWF title match coming up next. Standing right here at 450 pounds of pure champion. You understand that? Because tonight, Hulkamania died, and Sunday Mania is born. <laughs> WrestleMania 2 all over again. Yes, King Kong Bundy may be the number one contender right now. And of course, he may have your so called brain in his corner, Bobby. So called brain? Remember that Hulk Hogan has the support of millions and millions of Hulkamaniacs. All over the world. I don't care about those Hulkamorons all over the world. You see, I've got a surprise. A big surprise. A big surprise? A big surprise? surprise. Would you say it's a giant surprise? Bobby? I don't know what that surprise is, but I'm certain it will not be good. Vince, let's get back to you. Oh, my God. Hulk Hogan doesn't age until you take the bandana off. <laughs> Bobby Heenan should have done a late night talk show. He did. They produced the Bobby Heenan show. Didn't last. I think it only lasted like two episodes or something, but that was where Jameson came in. One of the most perplexing wrestling characters ever. I still don't understand that character. Of the world, Andre. Andre, the giant. No, El Generico and Sami Zayn are not the same person. No, they are not. Hey, boss. Now, this leads into the buildup for Survivor Series 1987, which was Team Hogan versus Team Andre, and they start recruiting people. There he is with that freaky bandana again. They said Andre was 7'5", but apparently he was only 6'10". Yeah, only 6'10". Um, yeah, they typically, like, exaggerate those. Like, Hogan, they said, was 6'8", and he's like, he's... Hogan is not 6'8". <laughs> and actually, here's another funny thing. In Rocky Three, they said Hogan was 7 feet. And that's because Stallone is super short in real life. Like, he's under 6 feet. Easy. So they said Hogan was 7 feet, so that Stallone... Uh, would seem taller and it would look like Hogan looks like astronomically tall and uh and Stallone looks taller than he really is it's inside on hell to hide my pride I gotta be a man I can't let it slide Whoa. Oh, is he gonna? He's gonna he do the body slam. Oh, he's gonna go after you. I'm going after you, brother. I'm not ripping this shirt, but uh, you know. 
one of these days I'm going to tear this shirt in half, but I just don't, I don't have the heart to do it. You should review all the Rocky movies. I might do that in the future because I do really like the Rocky movies. Uh, that's the, I'll be honest, that's my favorite film series of all time. Courage is the thing that keeps us free. Tear that shirt off when he comes back to WWE to put over Roman. Not Star Wars? No, no, the Rocky movies. They're number one, man. Number Rocky movies are number one. You ever thought about reviewing Halloween Havoc during Halloween? Um, not really. I never really thought about it, but it would be an interesting thing to do. Maybe do like a, a big video where I talk about like the best and worst of Halloween Havoc or something like that. That might be something I save. All right, big headlight on Bundy. Force to the ropes. Shoulder block by Hogan. Bundy does not move. Oh, Hogan's down. I like that Jesse called Hogan. Oh, a big knee lift by Hogan, and Bundy goes down. I like that Jesse called. Oh, box the slam. No, Hogan kicks out. But um, where was I going with this? Yeah, Jesse called Bundy beating Hogan an upset. I'm like, yeah, it is an upset because Hogan wins all the time. I like it when this shit makes sense. It's not like Cena. Oh, Cena's the underdog. Bullshitty is he wins 98% of the time. Not now, but back when he was at like the, the peak of his insufferable run. Halloween Havoc 2000. That show is scary. Yeah. <laughs> As is most things from WCW in 2000. All right, big body slam on Hogan. Oh, misses the big splash. Hogan's back up. Two. Uh, big clothesline. Big clothesline. Axe bomber. He just hit the axe bomber and Bundy went down. Elbow. Second elbow. Third elbow. One, two. No. Can't keep Bundy down like that. Oh, now Hogan's pounding him in the face. WWE logic, Roman Reigns, multiple time world champion, is being held down by the company. Went for a back body drop. That was a bad move. Yeah, Bundy, Bundy didn't, didn't have any of that shit. Oh, big knee drop. If Vince was in charge of WCW with uh, the roster they had at the time, would WCW had beaten WWF? Um. It's hard to say. Like, okay, Vince is in charge, like, in the Ted Turner role or, like, just another, like, the Eric Bischoff role? Like, because if he's in the Ted Turner role, probably yes. If he's in the Eric Bischoff role, maybe not because there's too much other shit going on and too many other, like, taskmasters and managers, like, mucking up the waters. Have you heard Jim Cornette's idea for turning Roman heel? No, I haven't. What is it? Andre, I remember you all looking on. And the hook 
Did you watch WCW's last pay-per-view? I did not. Did not watch it. Nope. We didn't know it was going to be their last pay-per-view at the time. Big chin lock on Hogan. Hogan's fading. Are we going to get the three arm raises? Hogan's fading. One. Two. No. Oh. Didn't go down the second time. Hogan's back in it. Come on, Hulk. Are you going to watch WWE's last pay-per-view? <laughs> I don't know. Tell me when that's going to be. Big boot! Bundy's down. Oh, oh, Andre tripped him. He went for the leg drop and Andre... Oh, oh, Andre's taking off the jacket. Uh, I didn't cheat. There's not me, boss. Dungeon of Doom, best faction ever. Best worst faction ever. Oh, Andre's been booted out from ringside. If Andre doesn't leave... Bundy will be disqualified. Basically, Jim said Roman should turn on Daniel Bryan, sodomize him with a rusty fishing knife, and go on a rant about how it's Bryan's fault that he's not over and he deserves the whole world. I mean, that might work. I mean, it's not a bad idea. Go after the guy that they like. Fantasy booking Dungeon of Doom versus Bullet Club. What would the storyline be? Uh, I can just picture Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks on the set of the Dungeon of Doom, like, mocking it and being dickheads. It'd be kind of great. Andre hasn't left yet. Oh, God, he just pushed the cameraman down. God damn, Andre. That's a great, like, little moment there. Wow. Yeah, try telling Andre the Giant what to do. Bad idea. All right, the match restarts. Hogan versus Bundy. Chapter 2, Electric Boogaloo. Oh, 
Well, let's get back to the match right now. As you can see, Bundy's taking over immediately on Hogan and getting an early advantage here. The Hawks are to the buckle. King Kong Bundy has certainly proven to be an awesome opponent thus far for the Hawks. Hogan with a clothesline in the corner. One. Oh, rams his head into one buckle. Then a second. Now he's going around the ring. Three. Four. All four corners. Bundy is dazed. Chopped by Hogan. Another chop. Who does he think he is? Ric Flair? Oh, misses an elbow drop. Bundy rolls out of the way. What do you think of the Die Hard movies? Um, the first one is one of my all-time favorite movies, like in my top five somewhere. The second one is a inferior but solid sequel. Third one's a lot of fun. I think the fourth one, A Live Free or Die Hard, is really good. Maybe even my favorite of the sequels. Um, I refused to watch the fifth one because I had uh, people told me about it, and it was like, no, that sounds terrible. I don't want to watch it. So, I, yeah, I really enjoy the Die Hard films. But the first one is the true classic of the bunch. NWO versus Bullet Club. Ooh, that's cool. Pay-per-view main event, Hollywood Hogan, Big Sexy Kevin Nash, and Scott Hall versus Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks. How cool would that be? Bear hug by Bundy. And the all too sweet after, yeah, the Bullet Club NWO Alliance. Oh, elbow by Hogan. Oh, Bear Hug is broken, but he's back down on the mat. Who would face who in each section of the faction? How about like Sean Waltman versus Marty Skrull? How good would that be? Maybe do Scott Steiner versus Cody. Um, Avalanche. Hogan goes down. Do like Gorillas of Destiny versus like Horace Hogan and, and Vincent. <laughs> One, two, Hogan kicks out. Hulking up, motherfucker. You. Boom! 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 Body slam! He gets him up and down! Oh, they're going outside the ring. Bunny. Hogan going into that pain free zone I've heard so much about. Oh, oh, what is Bobby doing? Bundy just defeated Hogan, but he doesn't win the title. Bobby, that was a bad move. Oh, 
What did you think of one, two, three kids shock win over Razor Ramon on Raw? Uh, I was legitimately shocked by it. I remember watching it and I was like, holy shit, the no name just beat Razor Ramon? Good God. Uh, Star Maker instantly. How did you react to Hogan's Hulk up on Rocket Mania 18 when you saw it? I marked out like a bitch. I went crazy. How why did Mick Foley go from deranged guy when he feuded with Undertaker to the lovable guy teaming with Rock? And which did you prefer? Um, I like the deranged gimmick, but Foley developing into the kind of the lovable goofball seemed to be more natural to his real personality. And I like both, but as a baby face, the lovable idiot was kind of like the one of the most like lovable and sympathetic characters in the history of wrestling. When he was a deranged lunatic, he was one of the biggest freak jobs in the history of wrestling. So that worked too. So I, I like both. Yeah, Dungeon of Doom would never go after Hogan's beating the shit out of Heenan. Um, yeah, Dungeon of Doom would never go after Bullet Club because Hogan's not there. So you know, Joe versus Angle and TNA. Uh, yeah, I've got some things to say about that. Mankind versus Marty the Moth. That would be cool. That would be cool. Yeah. So King Kong Bundy. Defeats Hulk Hogan, gets a victory over him on Saturday night's main event. Um, granted, it's by count out, but it's one of the more surprising results in the history of Saturday night's main event. And it actually sets up another title match between the two um, on a future edition of Saturday night's main event, which would be, I believe, Bundy's last match with the company on, on this particular run. What would ta Taskmaster sound like cutting a promo in Kenny Omega? Uh, like he has throat cancer. <laughs> if this was modern day WWE, Hogan would wrestle every show and Hulk up every show. Yep. Yep. And that's one of the problems. Okay, we've got one more match. I feel like with Savage, Brett, and Bundy Hogan, we're kind of done here, but we've got... Another one of these kind of throwaway matches in the main event. I believe it's Bam Bam Bigelow versus Hercules Hernandez. You know, I'm calling it a throwaway match. I actually like both Bam Bam and Hercules. Goddamn, motherfucker! Expose the business! I'll kill you, you motherfucker! Goddamn, Kenny Omega did a job for a six-year-old girl! Fuck! What the fuck? I miss George. I miss my pet room. Mil Muertes versus Minoru Suzuki or The Undertaker. Why not both? Why not both? Yeah, and of the three, like, Mil uh, Suzuki's the scariest one of the three. Well, Akura be it all in. That's the girl that Kenny Omega had the match with. <laughs> yeah, do the do the rematch. Muertes is basically Mexican Undertaker. Yes, and that's why I love him. Okay, this is a bad Vince move here. It's like, guys, you have Bam Bam Bigelow, and your impulse is to make him a baby face first in his initial run with the company. You look at him, and it's like, that's a baby face right there. That's a that's a that's a darling. Look how cute he is. Humperdinck. Great name. I like Oliver Humperdinck. I, I kind of miss him. 
God, this is one of those matches where everybody involved has passed away. Like, Herc is gone, Bam Bam's gone, Humperdinck's gone. That's a weird-looking logo for Bam Bam. Kind of cool, though. Suzuki will probably be leading the Yakuza after he's done wrestling. Probably. <laughs> Humperdinck sounds like a Sherlock character. Kind of. Uh. Yeah, Bam Bam. That's one of the coolest looks in pro wrestling ever. He, like, tattooed his bald head. That's awesome. Humperfink. Yeah, good one, Jesse. Bam Bam's like, fuck you, I didn't feel a thing. Imagine Kenny Omega doing a one-winged angel to Jim Cornette. What's your favorite Sherlock story? Um, God, there's so many good ones. Uh, the Red-Haired League. Uh, the Speckled Band is probably my number one. I really like the Speckled Band. Um, uh, what's the one with Irina Adler? Um, Scandal in Bohemia. That's the one with her. That's a really good one. The Dying Detective is a great one. Um, ooh, big shot by Hercules. Oh, uh, my favorite of the novels is Hound of the Baskervilles. That one's fantastic. There's, there's a reason why that's the most famous, uh, Sherlock story. It's like, it's the best one of the four novels. Um, God, I'm just going to sit here listing Sherlock stories all day. Uh, the Musgrave Rituals is a great one. I love that one. Um, the Dancing Men is awesome, especially like if you're a fan of like codes and uh, deciphering coded language or something. That's a great one. Did you watch AWA growing up? Very, very little, but yes. Uh, oh, he snapped Mare's Herc out of the ring. Are we going to get a double count out here? Bam Bam with a body slip. Yeah, we got a double count out. Do you think it annoys wrestlers that when they retire being a wrestler is all they will be remembered for by fans despite going into other projects? Depends on the person. I think some people love being remembered as a wrestler. Uh, some guys. What's what's Bam Bam saying? Do you think New Japan could beat WWE? Uh, not in the American market, no. Uh, WWE just has too much of a stranglehold over everything. So they restarting the match. So we get two restarts on the same show? That seems like a bit much. All right. Bam Bam versus Herc. Restarting. The second restart of the show. This is weird. 
Are they gonna? They gonna tackle each other? Boom! Nobody moves. Where's Jack Tunney with his music playing and talking about how the match needs to be restarted? Yeah, right? Right? We need to have half the show dedicated to the authority figure. Because by default, the authority figure is the most interesting thing on the show. Clearly. Oh, whoa! Bam Bam with the car wheel! Boom! All right, Irish whip, bam, bam, goes for a drop kick, but Herc hangs onto the rope. Imagine the Dungeon of Doom with Vince Russo booking. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, oh, my God. I love NXT and ROH for barely using authority figures at all. Yeah, they're just there to make decisions when they have to, and that's it. I mean, it's not that hard. Why, why does so much attention need to be focused on the authority figure? Because Austin McMahon happened, and ever since then, it's like the authority figure's got to be the most important thing on the show. Knee drop. Herc's in firm control here. All right, Herc's going up top. And Bam Bam catches him. Gorilla press, another fucking gorilla press. How many of those have I seen tonight? And drives Herc to the mat. Bam Bam comes through, slingshot, body splash. One, two, three. Bam Bam gets the win. That actually wasn't a bad match either. I, the restart was a bit awkward, especially since they had already done it earlier. But yeah, just a solid night of action. Austin McMahon was great, but it's like they just don't want to drop it for some reason. The only authority figure that deserves attention these days is El Jefe. Agreed. Dario Cueto is awesome. He's great. Yeah, um, yeah, I really enjoyed this edition of Saturday Night's Main Event. Um, really, the strength of the show is in the the Brett Savage match, which is awesome, and the Hogan Bundy match with uh, which is a really good match with uh, kind of a surprising result because Hogan actually loses. Why do people say they want the Attitude Era back? Uh, the reason they say that is because this era sucks so bad. It's like, God, remember what it used to be? God, remember what it used to be like? But yeah, it's a different era. You got to evolve into something different. But what it is now is just boring. Are you excited for the new Mission Impossible? I have never seen any of the Mission Impossible films. I have never seen any of them. I like how Sting was a superhero babyface that didn't win all the time. Yeah, wait until the matches with Vader. You got to check those out. Did Andre stand in the shower while wearing his clothes because his shirt's all wet? Oh, yeah, like the stuff that uh, they did back in the Attitude Era, they'd never get away with it today. They'd be like committing uh, PR suicide if they did even half of the things that they used to do. Because political correctness is fun. It's just so much fun. It's fun. They make everything more fun. The Bundaholics. I'm a Bundaholic. I 
Let me say this right now. I don't come in the dressing rooms often, but I want to shake your hand as far as I'm concerned. You want it as far as I'm concerned. You are the champion. PC Principal, yeah. PC Principal, one of my favorite South Park characters. You PC, bro? How much more could there possibly be? Hulk Hogan promo. Oh, he switched out the bandanas. Not Randy Savage? I would employ Randy Savage. Well, I mean, Savage got injured on this show, but... Um, yeah, it's like, okay, they're building up the Hogan Andre too, and they've got this stuff with Bundy in the meantime to serve as like a break in the story or like a building point in the story. You know, and they get a couple of big title matches and a couple of big Saturday Night's main events out of it along the way to get to Hogan Bundy or Hogan Andre too. Basic storytelling. It's not that hard. New Year's weekend will be the next Saturday night's main event, huh? Yes. So this was the final Saturday night's main event of uh, 1987. And I really like this show. Uh, again, like I said, it's the uh, the Brett Savage match, the Hogan Bundy match, and Andre's involvement in it. That's really the lifeblood of the show. Everything else, um, I like the the Steel Danny Davis match purely for yucks. Um, the, even the, the Bigelow Herc match wasn't bad. It was, it was a throwaway match, but it wasn't bad. Uh, just highly enjoyable episode this week. One of my more favorite episodes, uh, mainly because of the, the two big matches that were involved. So, uh, that concludes the stream for this week. Thank you all once again for joining me. Thank you all for staying up late on a Saturday night during Memorial Day weekend to join me. Um, that is all I have for you right now, though. Um, I will return with future videos in the coming weeks, uh, so be on the lookout for those. Be sure to like, subscribe, retweet, and do all that other fun stuff. Hit the little bell in the corner so you get notifications for all my videos. Uh, but like I said, that is all I have for you now. Uh, you all have a great night, a great Memorial Day weekend, and I will see you all later.